John Fort, welcome to the Pure Desire Podcast. Good to be here. Some people don't know that was round two of our intro. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Um, so we've been able to partner with you and Be Broken Ministries um, on a couple of projects in the past couple of years. One that was last year, now that we're in 2021, we, it was in that crazy year that will always be 2020. Um, we did a free uh, training for pastors and uh, I had not heard your story before. And so I got to hear some elements of it. Um, and one of them being same-sex attraction. Uh, and that for me is one of those areas that I've had guys in groups um, who have struggled with it, felt shame over it, doesn't know what to do with it. And I, I've even got a same-sex experience in my story. And so this is a topic I think we've wanted to talk about for a long time on the podcast. Yeah. And so being able to hear some of your story uh, really helped like, hey, okay, maybe we should have John on to help us kind of flesh this out from your experience. So we just appreciate you being here. Yeah, well, thanks for having me come. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for some of our listeners who um, maybe don't know about you or Be Broken Ministries, we just fill them in a little bit. What's your background and story? Sure. Um, an important part of my story, to me anyway, is that when I was really young, my dad worked two jobs, and so he wasn't around mm. very much. Um, and in addition to that, we lived on a farm that was far away from almost everybody except for one person lived next door to us. But other than that, it was, we were pretty remote. So I didn't have a lot of attention from peers, from anybody. Mm. Um, uh, and my mother was uh, wrapped up with younger siblings of mine and I was kind of just kicked out the door and left to fend for myself. Mm. Um, that left me really wanting a lot of affirmation and that kind of thing. And I had a neighbor who was, when I was around five, a neighbor who was 12, 13, somewhere in there, began sexually abusing me. And I, I didn't think of it as abuse or anything yeah. like that. It yeah. felt like attention to me. Yeah. Um, and that, when I was around seven, we moved into the city. And a, a, another teenager who was at the same age as that one was kind of took up where that one left off. Mm. And it must have been happening a lot because the neighborhood I went, grew up in, um, there was a lot of kind of sexual experimentation between boys and some between boys and girls. It just seemed to be everywhere. Yeah. Um, and that may just have been the location, whatever. I'm not sure what it was. So my background was a lot of that kind of, of thing going on, um, uh, starting really young and yeah. kind of continued all the way through mm -hmm. high school and even into college. Yeah. So talk a little bit about Be Broken Ministries. What, uh, what do you guys do there? Yeah. So Be Broken Ministries... Um, ministers to men, women, and families affected by sexual brokenness, leading them to wholeness in Christ and is, is our focus, and also training uh, trainers and, yep. and leaders yep. and that kind of thing. So that's our overall arching thing, similar to the same kind of things you do. Um, we don't do uh, focus as much on support groups, which is kind of your niche um, that we do. We have other services mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And I'm the director of training, so my job is to oversee online and written training materials and that kind of thing. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, John, we're excited to have you be sharing some of your story. And I, I know you've been open about this with groups and willing to talk. And, and I think it's so important because it is an area of human sexuality that still can be so taboo for so many people yep. that it's like it's becoming safer to talk about porn struggles or even addiction. But you start to bring up that same sex issue. And I think people just feel this like cavern of I just I can't bring it up. And so many people to echo what you said at the beginning, Trevor, this has been a part of their story in some way. Maybe it was something that happened to them, something as kids. And we kind of look back and go, that was weird. I don't get it. And we never talk about it. And so it just stays in those shadows. But I, I think we find it has a deeper impact in people's lives and we realize. And so that's kind of the point of today is, is to just have the conversation and hopefully help listeners mm -hmm. have some of that conversation in their own life that maybe haven't come to a point of integrating what happened or what they experienced. And so to... To go just a little more into your story, when, you know, you talk about a couple of relationships where you were being yeah. abused, but I, I know that then began to translate into same-sex attraction in your life. So as you're, you know, growing up as a kid, when do you start to realize that you're having like same-sex desires? And what was that realization like for you? Like, was it a shameful thing or was it just a, yeah. a sense of like, well, I guess this is something I'm going to deal with? Or how do you remember processing that, you know, maybe as a kid and into your teenage years? So to back up first, I always imagined that I would get married and have kids. When mm -hmm. I envisioned my future, um, Which, that's- Which, by the way, you, you are married and I you have kids. Have yeah. So that happens. Yeah, that's so, right. That, that, people that, that, that don't know John. <laughs> yes. And, and so I, that, I never imagined myself in the same-sex relationship or anything like that. Um, 
But when I was around 13 or 14, so, so what happened was around 11, there were other boys that we were doing kind of same-sex experimentation, they call it these days. Yep. Um, Which, because it is, because you are. You're just kind of yeah. curious and exploring. And, and I didn't... I didn't even know what sex was when that was happening. Bear yeah. in mind, I didn't understand that. It wasn't yeah. sexual in the sense that we think sexual is. But around age 11, they all stopped wanting to do that. We're not doing that anymore. Hmm. It doesn't feel right. I remember one of my friends saying, it doesn't feel right. And I began to kind of know what he meant because you begin to feel this, it's different. There's something, I didn't know the words to use, but it felt sexual. It felt there was something there. Hmm. But I very much wanted to keep doing those things and ended up finding... A, a, a few other, just not nearly as many, but a few boys that would do those kind of things with me. And I remember at 13 or 14 realizing it's like, wait a minute, I don't feel this way towards girls and I'm supposed to. Mm. And um, I never fantasized about anything to do with girls. And I never, uh, and so I began, that, that began to, to kind of scare me. And my response was just to not think about it. I just wouldn't let myself think about it. Um, I remember also um, in youth group, they would talk a lot about they're trying to keep kids from having sex. So they would kind of talk about that, but they didn't ever mention boys having sex together. So I, I didn't consider it sex. I just said, well, mm. this is, this doesn't really count. And that's kind of my rationalization yeah. for why yep. this is okay. This doesn't really count. And um, every once in a while, when I would allow myself to slow down enough and think, I would think, what if this makes me to where I can't be attracted to girls, but I would instantly put that thought out of my head. Mm because it was too scary. And so um, yeah. that's kind of the denial I was in at that time. Yeah. You know, I think what you're bringing up, John, is so important because we hear it all the time. And I mean, some of this in my story too, where our childhood sexual development, we were just simply never taught or trained yep. into health or what did it look like to um, mature, to go through puberty. And so we figure things out on our own and yep. often with a lack of information or with bad information that leads us down pathways we maybe didn't even mean to choose it just we're figuring it out on our own and we're 10 11 12 and so choices get made that that can affect our brains and our futures but but with a lack of training or someone in our lives to say hey here's what this means and here's what's going on and how can i help yep. and it just speaks to you know what you said to me earlier today that be broken is focusing on is the value and need of parents to be involved in their kids lives and usually at an earlier age than we expect right. because so many of us didn't have that our parents just didn't bring these things up, and so we figured it out, right? Yeah. So yeah, so one, I just wanted this came to my mind. There was a family we were working with uh, last year, um, and with this boy who'd gotten into pornography, and, and we kind of helped that conversation between parents mm -hmm. talk. And one of the things he mentioned was because um, today it's very different. So he heard other kids talking about some website, and so he went and looked at it because his parents had not yet thought to put filters on anything, and <clears throat> was exposed to all kinds of porn. Well, when we helped that conversation go, one of the things he mentioned was there were also uh, images of men on there, and he kind of got attracted to that. And like, what does that mean? You know, yeah. that, and, and so the yeah. thing is, it's like when our sexuality is emerging, we're attracted to anything. And it doesn't yeah. mean hmm. we're going to be gay or same-sex attracted. It doesn't mean that at all. And, it's and, the way our brain works. Right? Yeah. And that's why yeah. I feel like a lot of cultures in the past had taboos against that kind of stuff. Because if you just leave that to run its course, which is what happened to me as a kid, you will become attracted to your own sex and you'll keep reinforcing that. Hmm. And so yeah. for, for kids, it's like, that's why we don't want you running around looking at porn. Because who knows what you'll get attracted to in that case. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of assume that the brain is like wired. And this is, I think, a falsehood that's being perpetuated in our culture a lot that, well, the brain is wired one way or another. And, and so you're just acting out what your brain is wired for when the truth. And, and this isn't like a Christian principle. This is like a brain science principle that in a lot of ways with your sexuality, your brain is kind of a blank slate. And whatever you put on the slate, the brain learns from and goes, oh, OK, yeah. well, we want more of that. Right. And we grow in that direction, which is exactly what I hear you talking about in your experience. John. That was definitely true in my case. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just I'll say this: like um, <clears throat> to parents, I think it's important to realize that these conversations are happening um, right now, whether it's in your house or not. Um, you know, I, I lean a lot on my experience as a youth pastor in the past. That I mean, this was a topic all the time. Like this was something that got talked about all the time. And honestly, we're at a day and age where in every um, movie and show and song, and it's just, it's a normal part of life in so many cultures. And so I feel like 
Um, I would just echo the importance of that. And I'll be honest, as a parent of two young boys, like I know that conversations about this are coming. Um, I'm terrified about <laughs> it, but I know that they're coming. And so definitely lean into that as a parent um, with your kids. Um, John, we know that um, men and women, um, and I, I know some people personally who um, married, heterosexual marriage, but still have same-sex attraction um, and and struggle with maybe even um, homosexuality. Well, am I, am I, am I not? Uh, all of that. What would your encouragement, and this is a broad question, <laughs> what would your encouragement to them be? I mean, what, what did your story look like in that? Well, the other part of me is I went on to study biology and taught biology for nine years. And so genetics and biology and all that kind of stuff were part of my background. My mom was in medicine. My dad um, studied medicine before he decided to go into a job. So like all of that stuff, I was I, yeah. I, I was very sciencey kind of kid. Yeah. And so I knew that, um, I kind of knew even that the reason I was attracted to other boys was because of all this stuff that happened to mm -hmm. me. Um, I, I sort of was aware of that. And so I knew that I, my body would learn to be attracted to women if I would just give it a chance or, or, mm. or make it move in that direction. And I know that sounds, I, I know I'm not typical in that way, but I'm a very yeah. analytical kind of person. And yeah. so that, that um, it's very fortunate in my case. Um, <clears throat> so even before all the science was there to um, demonstrate that that is in fact how we work, I kind of moved on in that direction. Um, was this before marriage? Yeah. During? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, when I got married, um, I was disappointed in how much work it took to train myself to respond. Huh. Uh, but the interesting thing was, yeah. is that over time I became attracted uh, to women, but not just women, but a certain kind of women. We all have a sexual template. So here's an interesting thing, and I hope this is not too much detail. Go for it. But when I was, before I got married, I was attracted to very slender people, mm -hmm. right? Um, but when probably after, I don't know, 10 years of marriage or, or so, my wife was no longer slender, right? <laughs> and um, but what's interesting, because that is who I was having sex with, I became attracted to, I was still attracted to slender men, but I was also attracted to slightly heavy women. I know that sounds really weird, but that was became, it's like our body grows its sexual template. This mm -hmm. is neuroscience, neuroplasticity. Uh, I know you guys talk about that yeah, a yep, lot. Totally. I, I didn't know that word yet, but, but I can see it happening. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm right. saying? Yep. And fortunately, I had a really good therapist who, who seemed to understand the basics of it before people were talking about it. That really kind of helped me understand yeah. that area. And so I, by putting energy into focusing on my wife and not just sexual things, but uh, my therapist did a lot of stuff of teaching us to have non-sexual intimacy. Hmm. And how do you yeah. become feeling intimate to a person in a non, what does that right. even mean? I didn't even know like non-sexual intimacy. What are you even talking right. about? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, but that, that really helped us a lot was to him, him to focus on that kind of thing yeah. with, uh, with us. Um, that, that's one of the things is, if you're struggling with same-sex attraction, you need really, really wise guidance because there's some really bad advice out there from Christian sources that doesn't help at all. Hmm. Um, I fortunately had a therapist who had his PsyD, yeah. yep. who had a ton of training. You know, this wasn't just some guy who got a counseling degree, right? Um, <clears throat> and that made a gigantic difference to kind of help me go through this thing. So the, you heard the terminology, feed the right wolf. Well, I mean, you can think of sexual attraction that way. There's different things that we could be sexually attracted to. You put your energy into where you want to go. If you keep looking at gay porn, if you keep mm. fantasizing about mm. men or, or all that kind of stuff, that's going to grow. So there's a little bit of discipline in this. It's like, do I want my marriage to thrive or not? Um, and let's, let's step back from same-sex attraction. If you are a heterosexual male, you will still be attracted to women who aren't your wife. In my view, when I'm talking to other same-sex directed guys, you're not different. You are the same. All of us, if we allow ourselves to focus on it, will become sexually attracted to all kinds of people who are not our spouse. Mm -hmm. The answer isn't to divorce your spouse. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Because whoever you chase, the same thing's going to happen there. Yeah, yeah. Right. The answer That's is, right. whether it's same-sex attraction or not, is you keep investing in that. I remember we had one year... I was married for, uh, this was about 
five or six years after I entered therapy and all this other kind of stuff. And I found myself not feeling sexually attracted to my wife. And it scared me to death. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, but I just kept, you know, for, fortunately, I was still seeing a therapist every once in a while. And so, man, it, it just sure helps have other people to talk about this <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. Instead of just going off on your own on yeah, this. totally. And I kept putting into it. And it, it lasted about a year. But then my attraction to her came back with a vengeance and I was more attracted than ever. And so that's another piece of this. Mm -hmm. Here's a, I'm sorry to kind of go off, but just last summer, a guy, a friend of mine who used to be in a group called me and he was freaking out because he said, I don't feel attracted to my wife right now. And I just kind of smiled and said, yeah, that's, that's a normal thing that we, that yeah. I don't know if, every, I have no idea if everybody goes through it. That's a normal thing. Right. People do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and I said, he goes, what do I do? I said, you just keep spending time with her and investing in her. Mm. And it'll if you keep doing that and put her first, yeah. it'll come back, I think. Yeah. And, and so um, you guys may have more experience in that kind of area than I do. But. Well, no, I mean, in a case like that, what we can realize is we're really being driven by some cultural ideals of like, what does it mean to be married or in love or have sex? And, yep. and I think we've bought into some very Hollywoodized versions of marriage and sex. It's like, I don't know that that's true about humans, that for a lifetime, we will always feel like these lightning bolts and energy towards, wow, this one spouse. And if it's gone, people do. We can panic like, what's wrong? And, yeah. and that's why I'm so glad we're having this conversation today, because I think a lot of the answers, and I don't mean like one answer, but just finding answers is rooted in conversation. Mm -hmm. It's rooted in, well, let's bring this out into the open. And so going back to like those same sex questions, I think for a lot of people that are in a marriage, and, and they're feeling like, boy, am I maybe gay or I'm attracted to people the same gender? Should yeah. I go pursue that? It's because they're not able to recognize I maybe have options here. There's maybe things that are leading to that that I've never thought about. Yeah. There's maybe things I could be doing that would help me move in a different direction. And so if, if we just stay stuck in that silence and isolation, the other thing that I really believe happens is there is attraction to taboo things for all of us. There's yep. kind of a human yep. nature yep. of if, if it's off limits or somehow it's mysterious, novelty. there's yeah. a part of our brain made for novelty that'll yep. kind of go, oh, maybe I yep. should think about that more. And and so if, if you're able to just have the conversations with, like you said, John, people that care, people that have some understanding, people that are wise, just say, yep. man, I, yep. I'm feeling attraction to people the same gender and, and yet I'm married, what's going on? And someone talks you through it instead of having it stuck in this taboo nature place, it now becomes like, oh, some of this is maybe part of my past. Right. Some of this is part of what I'm choosing to engage in. Yeah. Some of it's the, the taboo nature of it that is attractive. Yeah. So when we can get that out on the table, the energy behind it, I think just changes and we can start to look at what is a better decision or wiser decisions look like. And I, I mean, and I, I've shared this on the podcast before that um, the same sex experience I had when I was 11 or 12 years old, was the one thing I was taking in my grave. Even when I stepped into recovery, I'm like, no one is gonna know about this. Like not my wife, not my kids, not my anybody, not even a therapist. If I hire one and pay them, I'm not gonna tell them. Um, and I remember when we were going through at the time, uh, the Conquer series was what we were starting with. And I remember uh, we, our group decided to do a full disclosure. Every week, one guy would do their full disclosure or the most up-to-date full disclosure they could create. And I wrote that out and I, I was so scared. I mean, I, I was holding the piece of paper and I was shaking and I remember I just shared and I just, I was just like, all right, I just got to do this. And I shared it and immediately, I mean, I just, I felt this like release, like, okay, uh, it's out there. And two guys looked at me and said, me too. And I, I, I still can feel it right now. Just like, I felt like, um, and you've made fun of me for this imagery before, but I felt like cold water just like went all the way down, like my head, my back, my shoulders. I just felt refreshment that it was this, I'm not alone. Like this is not something that just I, cause for years I felt like it was just me. I was the only one who had struggled with that. And so I, I love what you're saying because there's that release of shame for so many people and not, not normalizing the behavior, but you, you start to realize you're not alone. To go on the record, I would say I don't think I've ever made fun of you for that illustration. There are many others you I have, did. but that one you in particular. Did. It was like I three episodes, four episodes ago. You're like, that sounds awful. <laughs> okay, I think it was a different context. But anyway, John, an another part of this, you know, we might be the spouse in the situation where in the course of a marriage, it comes out or something is, there's an honest moment where a spouse confesses, hey, I'm feeling attracted to people of the same gender. If, if we're the spouse in that situation, what kind of response can we have? And what does it look like to perhaps try to help our spouse in this area? 
Yeah, I think today a lot of spouses would be terrified by that. They're yeah. thinking, oh, yeah. you're, you're about to tell me you're going to leave me for a man or mm-hmm. whatever, or, or, mm-hmm. or a woman, as the case yeah. may be. And um, that's usually not what they're... They're just trying to find safe people to talk about this, usually, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so... But it can be real threatening. But I think to the for the spouse to understand is this has nothing to do with you at all. Hmm. Um, it's not because you're not good enough you know they're saying well i've tried this out and i'd rather go back to my own gender that's not that's not what this is about yeah um it's about building relationships not sex like i mentioned what grew my wife and i together was focusing on the non-sexual kinds of intimacy mm-hmm. um and uh, some don't fall into the trap of like well i just got to have better sex it's like no, it's not gonna have it has nothing to do with this whatsoever um to me that seems like the best thing i can think of that really and maybe you need some help with that, so with some some therapy or whatever. But but the, basically, is you build that piece of it, um, and um, listen. I think would be a lot um, instead of mm-hmm. instead of getting defensive, but just try to listen if you can. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's you know it stresses the importance of having a uh, trusted community around you because if your spouse comes to you and says you know, I'm attracted to the same gender and, and maybe there's a little bit of a, a staggered disclosure that's involved mm-hmm. with that. Uh, maybe with some unwanted behavior. I think that's, what's important about having people in your life that you can be honest with, like having, mm-hmm. um, you know, f- if it's, if it's a man that you have other men in your life that you can go talk to about that or a woman, is the same mm-hmm. thing, creating that community in that space where it's not just something you have to hold and keep secret. And there's no one you can share this with. Mm-hmm. There's got to be that uh, for you, because that's that's a heavy burden that could be placed yeah. on your shoulders, right? Like if you, if a spouse is told that, um, one of the things they might think of is you, it sounds like this is something you need to talk with other people about, you know, to encourage them to do that. Because like you said, they may be too afraid. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think like in any situation, the awareness of I I can't fix someone else, yeah. and so you know they tell me, and now if I go into fix it mode, and well, I'm going to somehow get this out, and be like that's maybe just going to create a situation where you're pushing them further away. I, I think we want to maintain that receptive heart, someone to, you know, thank them for their honesty, yep. ask, you know, how we could help or support them. Yep. Um, what, what steps could we help encourage them to take? Like if, if there is a desire from your spouse for partnership in this, say, I'm, I'm telling you because I want to be honest and realize there's something I'm struggling with that you don't know that they're inviting you in in a good way and see that rather than getting terrified and scared, which mm-hmm. I also is, I think, normal, but to see, yeah. okay, this is healthy. And so there may be listeners, too, that have had an opposite situation where just what you're saying, John, was what happened, that it only came out when it was at the extreme of like, and I'm leaving and I'm done with this marriage. And and that's a whole different ball game where, where we're now talking recovery uh, for the spouse, not, you know, what do you yeah. do? In that case, it's really more how do you get healthy yeah. because they've gone off and made these choices. But I... I think if it's happening early in the story where someone's just say, I, I want to have a good marriage with you, but here's something I'm stuck in. Yep. How could you stay open to just say, I'm here to help and I love you and thanks for your honesty? Yeah. So John, from your experience, and it sounds like, you know, in youth group, there was growing up in and around the church. Um, what do you think that the church gets right and gets wrong when it comes to conversations or responses to same-sex attraction or even... Uh, the LGBTQ community in general. What do you think the church gets right, and what do you think the church gets wrong? What they get right is they're, at least a lot more than when I was a kid, they're beginning to actually talk about it. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it, you're, you're allowed to discuss this now, which um, maybe you weren't in some churches before. Hmm. Um, I think my church that I grew up in, they would have wanted to talk about it, they just didn't know how. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yep. Um, the... The thing as far as what we do wrong, I think, is, and this is coming, because I work with a lot of men who have same-sex attraction, too, and a lot of them aren't married, and that's a a different situation, a different set of pressures. But um, what I'm hearing from them is that they get the impression from the church that the church has an agenda, and the agenda is to fix them. Mm. And... um, God is the one who fixes with the help of, of good therapists. I keep mentioning therapy a lot, but I, I'm sorry. Do that, you want to give the name uh, of your therapist for our <laughs> listeners? No, 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 it's okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, the, uh, the, the, I mean, 
we we all need therapy. I'm just kind of I grew up. My dad was a very like ah only wimps need therapy. Like I, I've been to like I don't know 15 years of therapy I think in my life. So uh, it it and it's, you're better for it. It's done nothing yeah. but good. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but that's not the church's job. The church's job is to be their friend. And so hmm. I think we have to be come clean about what is our agenda. Of course, we want to help people, and maybe we have ideas and things like that. But really, what they need is a person now. Part of being a friend may be to say, I think maybe you need some counseling and maybe help them find a good counselor. Sure. I've done that. Yeah. Um, but un, un, I'm not a trained counselor. And so even though I have a ton of experiences, I'm the director of training. I know a ton about this. I'm going to be careful yeah. about yeah. what I try to do. And then the church, too. The church, you don't, anybody knows how to be a friend. So spend time with people. Um mm-hmm. I feel like some people in the church are afraid of, like, if a person says they say have same-sex attraction, they're like, oh, I don't know what to, do. you know, it's like, um, uh, the church I go to actually has gotten pretty open about this, and and I mean, the pastor told me one time, there's a whole lot of guys in here with same-sex attractions, and that actually, statistically, with the number of a church, number of guys, about, sounds about right to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So, yeah. and they're married, you know, kind yeah. of thing. Right. Um, let's just make this not so hard, not so bad to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um we don't have enough uh, uh, physical affection. I lived in mm-hmm. Brazil for a couple of years, and there, it, even I was freaked out by how physically affectionate guys are towards each other. It was a little like, cause we sexualize the everything. men like to hug. I've been to Brazil. Yeah, they yeah. are huggers. <laughs> yeah, and, and so. <laughs> Among other things. So here's what I needed was male affection the right way. Yeah. Okay. Like intimacy. And, yeah, intimacy. Yeah, the healthy and, intimacy. And even talking, and it's like, yeah. here's what, you, if you look at the Bible, there's just, it's just full of men being way more intimate than we're comfortable with. Yep. There are parts in the Bible that make us feel awkward, right? right. Um, right. So obviously, we're, our culture has gotten off, and our church has been wildly affected by that. Mm. I don't know, this, just because, so for me, I need to be more affectionate with guys but because I grew up with a dad who was not that way, yeah. it also feels extremely awkward at the same time. So I'm yep. a person that yep. it's it's something that I need is feels extraordinarily awkward to me. Yep. And so that's the kind of it. I'm not saying it's easy to solve, but that's one of the issues. Um, and then people being more open with their own brokenness, like yep. the people who are same sex attracted need to not be the only ones in the church that are being open about what they're dealing with. You yes. Know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's good. So. Yeah, when I think of where the church is maybe missing the mark that I, I sure hope changes, is I feel like when we start talking about same-sex issues or anything under the LGBTQ umbrella, it, it's like it becomes a whole different topic. It's like over here we can talk about the Bible and sin and forgiveness, and but then it's like, whoa, right. same sex. Well, that's kind of a—we yeah. just treat it so differently, and I think it even communicates to the person struggling— I, well, I don't want to bring this up because I don't want to end up in that different category. Right. I want to stay over here with the rest. And what I hear you saying, John, about we, we all need to be open about brokenness. I think that's where a church needs to expand its view of brokenness and love and forgiveness to say we're we're yeah. all in the same boat here. Right. Some maybe have eating issues. Some maybe have spending issues. Yeah. Some have pride issues. Some have same-sex issues. Some mm-hmm. have porn. It, like mm-hmm. these aren't different boats that we have to bring yeah. Jesus to a different place for that group. Yep. It's like. We are all in the same boat together of people that need to understand who God made mm-hmm. us to be, his radical love for us. And that is yes. true whether my issue is lying or same-sex desires. Like yes. we're, we're in yes. the same boat. And yep. I think when the church can communicate that message, people will have the freedom to be at church and say, yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm gay or straight or I'm, got, I'm all messed up sexually, but I know that I'm loved, that Jesus yep. loves me. And my only hope of finding yeah. some kind of fulfilling life is going to come from me leaning into God yeah. and into mm-hmm. his community rather than feeling like I have to avoid it because I'm in that other category over right. there. Yeah, yeah. I think um, a couple of things are coming to mind. Uh, we talk about here a lot, grace and competency, the ability to, as you were saying, be a friend, be gracious, be understanding. And I think, I think we confuse understanding, like being understanding doesn't actually mean you understand. You can be understanding towards someone who has same-sex attraction, even though you don't. Uh, you can still express understanding with them. Um, but then competency, too, that idea of, you know, educate yourself on what, um, and again, this isn't like a how to fix somebody, but educate yourself with who are the who are the people or the resources or organizations that uh, help address this topic, mm-hmm. that uh, create resources and help people think through what the process may look like. Our listeners are um, probably, I, I would guess um, that there are some who 
this is an unwanted attraction or an unwanted behavior. And so if that's the case, we do need to have resources for people mm -hmm. to go and, and, and pursue what healing might look like in this area. Um, but I just think grace and competency would be the two like summarizing statements for me. Mm -hmm. So, John, this is a question we were really interested to get your take on because I think it's occupying a lot of people's hearts and minds when it comes to same-sex attraction and issues with this. They're, they're asking the question, can someone ever stop same-sex attraction? Because we get the two sides, You're I think, smiling in like you. We get like, well, <laughs> yeah, I was born this, this way question. and I can never change. And then yeah. we get others are like, no, this is totally a choice. And I, I think it leaves people really confused of like, yeah. well, yeah. which is it? So. Yeah. Yeah. So, when someone so, asks that question, how do you respond? So I'm going to tell you my opinion, and that's don't what you're here if for. <laughs> you, if we have placed you as the expert, okay. John. Please, because of the kind of work I work in sexual integrity all the time, and talk to people all the time, and I yeah. know tons of people who have come from same-sex attraction background. Um, when I press them, uh, sometimes they'll talk as if they don't. That never. They never feel that ever, and I press them. And so far, 100% say, well, yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel that. Yeah. And so here's my way of looking at it. Why are we making... Let me, let me tell you a story that a pastor told me. I won't tell you which pastor. This pastor grew up... He became a pastor later. He had a really rough life growing up. The first time he had sex, he said well, he was 13 years old. Him and a 13-year-old girl had sex. For, okay. And he said, if I'm being honest, I learned... My first imprint on sexuality was 13-year-old girls. And he goes, so teenage girls can be attractive. I don't focus on that. Okay, so how is that any different? Anyone we've ever been attracted to and have reinforced that through masturbation or fantasy or, yep. or even sex or whatever, yep. that doesn't necessarily go away. It's always there. I think of it like a scar. Um, our scars can heal but they don't go away. And so to some people, it, it's, it, it's all over the map. And instead of trying to focus on never feeling sex, it's like, that, right. it, it's, not, it's not a sin to have an attraction. It's a sin to do something wrong with that attraction. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. We're attracted to like expensive cars that we probably shouldn't be spending our money on. We're attracted <laughs> to all kinds of, like, we're trying yeah. to make this be like, like you said, this own weird special category. Yeah. And um, so if, if it's unwanted and I want to move away from that kind of thing, it's like, yeah. I try to tell people, it's probably not going to go, you need to quit focusing on that. The more, right. focus on what, what, what do you want to do yeah. with your sexuality yep. and with your desire? Let's focus on that. Yeah. And this will diminish. And, um, in my experiences uh, is during really stressful times, sometimes that come resurfaces, but then other times it's just not there at all. Yeah. But maybe somebody's different to where it's always kind of this low undercurrent of it all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine. There's a low undercurrent to, you know, do all kinds of things that, that aren't healthy for us. So yeah. I, yeah. I, I, it's, just, it's just not right. different. Well, and what you're describing, um, you know, for us, we, we've we learned in the recovery process is it's not just stopping the behavior you don't want to do anymore. It's replacing it with those healthy behaviors uh, that you do want to do that are going to bring you toward the life that you want to live. And I think that that's, that's what I hear. I hear like Colossians, the taking off and putting on um, that idea too. I, I think that that's a, a principle that I see kind of overlapping even in this area. And you even talked about it in your story. It's not just a, um, it's not just your attraction just decreased when you got married. The more that you pressed into your relationship with your wife and grew mm -hmm. the intimacy that you had in that connection, the attraction then grew for your wife, mm -hmm. even though you'd had this attraction to the same gender before. Right. If I spent few hours every week looking at gay porn, that's not going to help my attraction right. to my wife. Yep. <laughs> but if I sit around and looked at any kind of porn, it's not going to help my Correct. attraction. Correct. Exactly. Yes. Right. Good Good to make that distinction. And I think <laughs> what you're hitting on is gets into our faulty views of healing. And, and we hear this whether someone's struggling with pornography and masturbation or same sex issues is they think, well, if, if God heals me from this, it means I will never, ever desire it or want it again which would be amazing. And I think God could do that because I believe in a God of miracles that can do what he wants. Sure. But on the other hand, I also don't think that's realistic to the human experience of living in human bodies in yeah. a human world where we're not perfect. And so I feel like we can be set free and in the process of healing from addictive behavior, unwanted patterns, even while a desire is still there. And that doesn't mean, you know, because I hear guys say like, oh man, I still have these lustful thoughts. Am I not free? 
It's like, well, you're a human. You may have those triggers or thoughts that'll come into your mind till you die. That's part of our our life with Jesus of being mm-hmm. sanctified and becoming right. more like him that there's not a magic pill we take that it never is there anymore. Right. But I, I think that can keep us from saying, well, I, I am being transformed. I am experiencing healing and change because there's not this magic line between mm-hmm. people that have lustful thoughts who are stuck and then above the line, people that never, ever have lustful thoughts. Like right. if that's the dividing line, there aren't many healed people, in my opinion, in the world. Mm-hmm. Whether their lust is for, like you said, expensive cars or women or men or like whatever their desires run to. Yeah. And, and I'm not trying to minimize the work of Jesus in our life or believe that he doesn't have power to heal or transform. I'm just recognizing, I believe we're told that sanctification perfection is only completed when we leave this mortal body. So if, if in this mortal body we still have unwanted desires, like, well, Welcome to humanity. But yep. even within that journey, Jesus is, can do an incredible work in us where we could say, I'm, I'm not living out those things. What you said, John, I'm not choosing those patterns or behaviors anymore. Yep. Do they still once in a while surface? Yeah, but when they do, I don't have to panic, freak out, think I'm still trapped, go, oh, there's maybe something in my brain that remembers yep. that scar, remembers what that drug felt like or right. when it made me feel good. Yes. And I can make a choice to go in a different direction. And to yep. me... That's freedom, yep. making that choice to go in a different direction. Yeah. Okay, so um, looking at a marriage, again, a heterosexual marriage where one of the spouses is same-sex attract, uh, attracted, um, what does what does a healthy, because I, I know that not everybody, uh, I've, I mean, I've heard this from people that not as you, and I think you, you even mentioned it, uh, that the attraction won't necessarily go away. So what does it look like to still have that attraction but still be married to your spouse? What does a healthy relationship in that dynamic look like? Well, one of the issues is if we focus too much, because I'm in that situation, if I focus too much on on past same-sex attractions or, or anything that maybe comes up or whatever, I fo- if I spend my focus on that, I'm just going to be miserable. Yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> so right. what I need to do is say when those things come up is like, okay, that, that that's not going to, that's not going to help me at all. And so focus on my wife. It's like, it's time to t- time to go spend some time with my wife. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily mean having sex. That's not what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, this time. Right. And so, and what I found is that my relationship, with my wife is fantastic. Um, and that's it, it, what's interesting is my sexual life with my wife is better than I ever imagined anything could be, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. But, but, um, by, by this thing that I have to, that makes me work so hard on my relationship with my wife, just makes my relationship life better than most people I know who are married. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of an interesting thing. You have to have heard this many times. It's like, I could curse my past sexual addictions and all this other kind of stuff like that. But the reality of it is the fact that I had to work through that made me way better than I ever, I would have been a very shallow Christian other if I didn't have to be humbled and work yeah. through all this. Stuff. And some people talk about um, being grateful for their addictions. And that, it, it sounds weird. I don't mean it that way, but it's like my wife and I have talked about like, if we didn't have to go through this, yeah. we would not have what we have here. And I don't, how do you reconcile that? You, you know, that's a tough yeah. thing. Uh, I mean, I was a really confused kid a lot of times. Um, and we don't want kids to go through emotional pain and all this other kind of stuff like that. But I, uh, you yeah, know, some people react to that differently. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so as far as a relationship, it, it is um, spend lots of time with people, have deeper relationships. I'm some I know I, I talk a lot, but I'm actually somewhat of an introvert. So I don't have a ton of friends. I have a few friends, but yeah. spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. It's just as important for my relationship with my wife that I spend time with some guys during the that's week. Good. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. That's good. So what is it on the flip side of that, John, what does it look like if we're a friend to someone and maybe we've been in group with them or just we've got the kind of relationship they've been honest with us and they share that they have a same sex attraction story or history or current struggle. And particularly if it's maybe not our issue, we might feel a sense of like, how do I relate to you? If, if we're, you know, same gender as this friend, what does it look like to offer good, healthy friendship to someone who is having same-sex attraction issues? Do we need to, you know, pull away and never hug them? Because I think some people might go, they're like, well, That's I don't want to be a trigger. Or, yeah, right. So 
help listeners process that they want to be a friend. They want to help, but maybe there's a part of this like, this is a little out of my yeah. experience or comfort zone. I don't know how to be your friend. Yep. What does that look like? So what kind of advice or direction would you give on how do we be good friends to people of the same gender who've let us know I've got same sex issues? I read very recently in a book I'm reading that that compassion is not empathizing for somebody. It's getting down in the dirt with them hmm. and staying there. And yeah. so the being a friend, again, is not fixing anything. Right. You don't have to come up with it just to be a friend, spend time with them. Mm -hmm. I would say you probably should hug them. We should be hugging each other more anyway. I'm not good yeah. at that. I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, COVID has definitely helped that, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, don't touch okay, me, yeah. please, maybe, sir. Maybe, yes, yeah, maybe right. it did. But yeah. what I'm saying is, <laughs> is you should, you know, once COVID is over, we, you should hug people. I think we should be doing that more anyway. Yeah. I know we're all awkward. You know, the fact that we're all so awkward about that as a culture is a problem. Yeah. But, um, um, but spend, just spend lots of time with them. Like make them be wanted. It, yeah. It's it's a lot of same sex attraction comes from not being feeling wanted by your own gender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it seems to me like we have to, as a society, relearn appropriate physical touch that's non sexual. Because I think in our society we we've, we've yeah. sexualized any form of touch, yeah. and that to me, like as a dad, um, you know, I have two teenage daughters now, and I try to make it a point. Obviously, non sexual touch, like to give them a little scratch on the back or pat their shoulder, you know, give them a mm -hmm. hug, put yeah. my arm around them so that they are really internalizing. I can have physical touch that's non-sexual from people that love me. And that should be yep. our normal. But I, I think same sex issues issues have actually caused a deterioration of that, that we, we tend to hug less mm -hmm. touch that just because we don't have a language of appropriate mm -hmm. physical contact. And so I, I think in friendship, that's maybe a place to even relearn to say, you know, is it, is it okay that I grabbed your shoulder? Mm -hmm. right. Could could we hug? And yeah. and relearning that, just say, this is someone that cares about me and it's non-sexual. Right. Yep. Our brain then, I think, starts to learn from that and go, oh, there's there's actually healthy ways I can have relationships with people of my same gender yeah. mm -hmm. that doesn't have to be sexual. And yeah. that is part of, I think, our healing and transformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, and to summarize what you're saying, John, what it sounds like is you just treat them like you would a normal friend. <laughs> like... You know, my friend Justin is our producer. He's my best friend in the whole world. I hug him all the time. And mm -hmm. so if if I really am treating a friend of mine who has same-sex attraction just like a friend, I would hug him the same way I'd hug him. Mm -hmm. And and for me, I think it's that um, – and I, I think that if you know that about somebody, it's also okay to say, hey, if something I do makes you feel uncomfortable, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't want me to hug you, then respect that boundary. But – Again, like mm -hmm. I just what I, what I hear you saying is just treat them like a normal yeah. friend. Don't treat them any different. And, and one of the things is too is just spending time with each other. Is yeah. that that uh, again? I know we're in a weird time and maybe people can't do that right now. But <laughs> but um, go one out one day. Yeah, yeah. One go day. out to coffee with them. Um, invite right. them over for dinner. Say hey, can we come over and have dinner with you guys? Yeah. Can, I mean just yeah. I mean really invest in people. It's amazing. Hmm. You know when you think about the church. When I if I visit a church that's relatively new. Boy, they everybody wants to meet you and all that yeah, kind of stuff, right. and you feel wow, they're so friendly. They're not friendly; they're trying to grow the church, right? And they're huh. de they're desperate. For <laughs> if if you go to a church that's been around for a hundred years, oh. which there are some, you know, there's plenty of those around. Like Jerry, that's my spot in the front yeah, row. Yeah, okay. it, it, it's completely different. It's like pe people. It, it, going in, they're, they may be nice, but they're not trying to get to know you because they already have the group of friends. Right. So I think it's actually more of a challenge for a well-established church because you've already got your circle group and you don't want more people in your circle group. I mean, it's painful to say this person needs <coughs> to be in. I really see that a lot in, in churches. Yep. The well-established churches is, have lost the ability to really welcome people into the family. Yep. Yeah. I, I think the word, and it's funny because I think we've really let our culture misuse it, but inclusivity, not meaning that, well, I'm just going to accept your behavior and call it okay, and we're going to change all the rules, but that inclusivity just means I'm going to include you as a person. Mm -hmm. No matter what your sin is, your struggle is, your skin color, your background, like we are including you in the community of God's people because that's what God did for us. And if we're going to be God's agents and ambassadors and representatives in this world, mm -hmm. then me including you as a human being worthy of love and respect and dignity that's just what I do because I'm trying to love like God loved me. And, and it, you know, there may come times for conversations about what's, you know, appropriate behavior or what is God calling us to in terms of people that follow him. But 
I, I think we can put the cart before the horse of just trying to figure out, well, if we include them first, what are we saying about their lifestyle? Like, yep. just love people, include them, be their friend, and and trust that God's the one that yep. heals, not us. I mean, so much of what you said, John, I think we can reflect on and say that this would help us be better friends, help us be better church members, help us be better brothers and sisters, just because when we start and see a person as a person and not for their struggle— then we create the kind of relationships and conversations that can lead yep. to growth and transformation. This reminds me of a situation that's come up. I remember I've been working in this area for a long time, and the question comes up like in a support group setting is sometimes people say, well, I want to be in a support group where, where all the men have same-sex attraction. Uh, I think it's a really bad idea, and not because mm-hmm. that they're going to connect. That's not the point. The bad idea is what same-sex attracted men need is acceptance from heterosexual men. That's a good word. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is, is yeah. like, it, it is if you are a heterosexual and somebody has same-sex attraction, the answer is not to find them another same-sex attracted guy who's in their situation to relate to. Yeah. He, that, that, there's some benefits yeah, from some, that. We need people to relate yeah. to. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep. Yep. But, but maybe more than that, he needs somebody who knows he has this. That's, that's another thing. He has this, this struggle or whatever you want to call it. Um, and just treats them like another person. Right. And, and because what we don't need is none of us need to be affirmed in what we're doing with our sexuality. We need to be affirmed as a human being. Yeah. And, and our so culture good. focuses so much on, well, you have to affirm my sexual, what, what, what I'm doing with my, I don't, why do I need to even know what you're doing with your sexuality? It's like, well, well since when has that become the greatest right. thing on, you know, so there's that kind of a, yeah. Yeah. That's that's good. That is good. That it, <clears throat> I don't just need to have people around me who uh, struggle with the same thing that I do to accept me. I need people around me who maybe struggle with different things to also – because I, I think that I know I can get into that where um, specifically right now anger is like this big thing for me. And so I'm, I'll am i share it with the friends I know who get angry at their kids too. I'm like, oh, yeah, like you know, we talk about it. We try mm-hmm. to do it. But how much am I willing to share that just with other friends who maybe that isn't, you know, and being able to then accept that acceptance and love from them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think to, to kind of wrap this up, I think one of the things that really stuck out is just this idea, and we talked about it a little bit here, that we shouldn't put this category, we shouldn't put this topic into its own category, that that brokenness impacts everybody um, and it manifests differently in everyone's story. And I think that it's really important that we um, respond with grace. And as you talked about, John, with friendship to those uh, who have same-sex attraction and share that with us because from my experience, that is one of the most uh, nerve-wracking experiences for someone who has same-sex attraction is sharing it with other people, Mm -hmm. especially in the church. And so our response is so important. And so um, we hope that this conversation helped maybe normalize the conversation a little bit more. Uh, And if you are struggling with or have same-sex attraction, we hope that this gives you hope that um, living in healthy sexuality is possible. It absolutely is possible. And I love what you said, John, that it's not just stopping thinking about this or exploring this. It's actually moving toward health in the areas that you want to that really changes that behavior. So uh, thanks just for being here. Thanks for your vulnerability, sharing your story. Yeah, well, thanks for letting me come. Yeah, great conversation. And wherever you're at on your journey, Pure Desire is here to help create a roadmap for your healing. If you or someone you know is impacted by sexual brokenness, go to puredesire.org and let's start the healing journey today. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Each week we put out new content to help you on the road to freedom from the effects of sexual brokenness. And lastly, never stop being healthy.